Ryan. All yours. Thank you. All right, welcome to another exciting edition of the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Uh, following the Hyper Emergency Powers to Act of Hyperledger, I am stepping in as the uh, vice chair today because Arno is unavailable. Uh, this is Dan Middleton, and so for agenda today, we've got uh, an announcement or two, and then we're going to have a discussion about some Ethereum-related topics, which should be interesting, including a proposal from Sean Young. Uh, and then time remaining, we can uh, get a discussion started at least on uh, some of the, the long-term agenda that we want to do for uh, the rest of this incarnation of the, the TSC. Uh, there's also a quarterly report. I don't know if we will be discussing that in detail. I didn't see anything of uh, uh, anything that, that really might warrant a lot of discussion. So let's go ahead and jump into it then. Um, I see Min is online. Min, would you like to talk about what you've got listed there for the mentorship? Sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, sorry, my voice is still a little bit strained coming out of a cold. But um, so yeah, just really quickly, uh, I'm looking for 10 volunteers um, to review this year's mentorship project proposals. Um, originally, we we're planning to close the project proposal submission this Friday, but thinking we have the uh, Global Forum next week, uh, it will be a great opportunity for the staff and the community to promote our mentorship program. So we're extending the deadline to um, Sunday next week, um, so March the 8th. Um, regardless, we need to form this, a, a subcommittee to review um, the project proposals. We have funding um, for 18 projects this year. Uh, so far, we've received 12. So I'm anticipating that we'll receive probably more than 18. So primarily, the subcommittee will be reviewing the um, the proposals that we receive, uh, making sure, you know, these are quality projects, they're clearly scoped, suitable, you know, for a mentee um, to work on, and also, you know, it's advancing hyperledger technologies. Uh, so I posted the link to the review process and criteria under um, in, in the announcement section. Um, so I already received, I know, Angelo, you already said that you will be, uh, you know, uh, would love to participate. So I'm looking for or, you know, eight or nine more people. Um, so just let me know um, by email. So I posted my email address there by March 5th um, to participate in this, com uh, this subcommittee. Any questions? Just to give you context, last year we funded uh, 17 projects. We received uh, 27 proposals. So the committee went through the 27 proposals, you know, had to eliminate, um, not eliminate, but um, you know, select the top 17 um, uh, out of the 27 proposals that we received to, uh, to fund. So this year I'm anticipating we'll probably receive, you know, uh, similar number of proposals. Um, so we'll need to, um, you know, uh, have the committee go through the proposals. Um, it should be pretty lightweight um, because the proposals are, it's a templated uh, format, it, you know, just uh, take a look at the, the, the proposal details and and select the 18 that, <clears throat> that we think are worthwhile uh, to fund. Okay, thanks, Min. So if anybody has any questions about that later, uh, you can see Min's email on there and you can reach out to her as well. Great. Thanks. Um, so uh, a related announcement that did not get added to the page yet, but maybe I can do that after the fact is uh, we have a mentor session next week at Global Forum, and we're still looking for mentors to attend that. So that's as the Global Forum kicks off on Tuesday morning, we've got interested, um, I guess, new contributors or, or mentees signed up to get a little bit of coaching from experienced people in the community. And so we're looking for some volunteers to uh, help do that mentoring. And we can get a link put on to uh, the agenda later for that. So you'll have that to reference. But we are about um, four or five heads short of what we need to make that a successful session. So we're looking for help with that. Uh, Brian, with uh, Global Forum starting next week, is there anything else that, that we'd like to interject at this point? <clears throat> 
no, just that uh, there's a lot of great content. There's 124 something like that speakers across uh, 80 different, 85 different sessions. Um, I, and uh, I don't know if anyone hasn't, you know, still on the bubble uh, about coming. Um, uh, please do if you can. Um, uh, but uh, I, yeah, we're we're all geared up and excited about it. Uh, so uh, um, yeah, <laughs> I, nothing else I can think of to mention other than uh, it, it's it's looking good. Okay, great. Well, look forward to seeing a lot of you in Arizona next week. I know for where I live, that'll be a nice change in weather for me. Uh, maybe for some of you as well. All right, uh, I see Bob is on the line. Mr. Summerwell, would you like to take us into the wonderful world of Ethereum flavored WASM and some of the impact uh, that that implies for the Ethereum community and maybe how that might help us grow things within Hyperledger? Hello, yes, I absolutely can. Um, so hi, for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, my name is, is Bob Sumwell. Uh, I am currently the executive director of the Ethereum Classic uh, Cooperative, but I've been part of the Ethereum, the broader Ethereum ecosystem for, uh, for five years now, uh, heavily involved with the start of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance and have been a, a Hyperledger fan and supporter for, for many years. Um, so the situation that you really have on Ethereum is, I mean, the core of Ethereum is the Ethereum virtual machine. You know, this, this concept of a, uh, a, a gas-limited general virtual machine. Um, Solidity is by far the most popular of the smart contract languages targeting um, the EVM. Um, but you have historically had uh, other languages as well. Um, Viper is, is, is about the, the, the second most popular language now, a, uh, a Python-based uh, alternative. Um, where WebAssembly and specifically eWASM come in is that there has been this effort over the past, goodness, um, uh, perhaps three, three or, or more years now, looking at the option of replacing the Ethereum virtual machine with uh, an augmented um, web assembly, really based on the observation that at the time the Ethereum project started, um, there wasn't a, a, a good off-the-shelf um, alternative um, which, which met the sort of uh, deterministic VM needs that, that the project was looking for. Um, WebAssembly started shortly afterwards, and the observation was that if you um, augmented the code generation for WebAssembly with uh, sort of wrapping, quite equivalent really to exception handling um, for adding the, the gas counting, that you could that you could target um, WebAssembly for execution of smart contracts. And that uh, relying on the the work of of Microsoft and uh, and Google and uh, and Mozilla and so on might uh, have higher quality than things that we could do ourselves. So anyway, the, the, there's been a single primary compiler for um, for Solidity through all that time, the Solsi compiler, which is maintained by the Ethereum Foundation. But what we have going on, both with uh, Solang, but also with a, another project called Sol, S-O-L-L, -L, is we're seeing um, the beginnings of alternate um, Solidity compilers initially, but that those toolings can really become part of richer compiler sets, uh, all really built around LLVM. So for anyone who doesn't know, LLVM is, is, is the basis of um, a, a large chunk of, of compiler technology in the world right now. Uh, the whole of the Objective-C um, ecosystem, Clang C++ compiler, the primary Rust compiler, uh, the Swift compiler, all of those are built around LLVM. And I think really maybe the analogy here is that Sol C, you could think of that as, as sort of like being GCC era 
you know, that you're in the 1980s and GCC is your only option. Um, you really don't have a lot of rich tooling. You're doing sort of printf debugging and uh, errors are, are core dumps. That was sort of the era that we were coming from. And what you really see with these, with these newer approaches is uh, things equivalent to the, the appearance of, of Clang and LLVM. So anyway, I've, I've been brokering dialogue over the last several months here um, between groups within this uh, emergent paradigm. Um, so you, you, you have Sol, which is a Solidity compiler written uh, in, in C++ LLVM, um, which comes with an eWASM backend. But there is an optional EVM backend there, which is maintained by uh, HC Core, which has just recently come to an alpha state. So what they have on that code base is they have ERC20 token uh, sort of compilation um, where the generated bytecode is, is live on the Ethereum and ETC mainnet. You know, so you have a, a sort of an alpha. Uh, actually, that was last October, that was. It's further on to alpha now. So you really have a state where for, for constrained set of use cases, you know, you have a, a viable alternate compiler there which can be used live on, on Ethereum or, or ETC uh, or for an eWASM backend targeting Ethereum 2. Um, also on Sean's side, you have Solang, um, you know, a similar kind of approach but using... Uh, a Rust implementation with, with LLVM uh, with a WASM backend, so targeting different flavors of WASM, um, originally aimed at Hyperledger uh, Burrow, but also now supporting Substrate um, uh, from Parity Technologies and supporting um, Saber, which is the, the, the WASM backend for, for Burrow and also supporting eWASM from Ethereum 2. Um, what you have with the LLVM EVM backend, which Alan Lee at ETC um, Core Labs have been supporting, is, is, is what you've really got there is, is an alternate uh, code generation backend for LLVM, targeting EVM in the same way as you would target x86 or ARM or WASM or MIPS or whatever you have. Um, and the intention there is to actually ultimately get that work um, upstreamed into uh, proper LLVM so that you have official support for LL, sorry, for, for EVM as a, um, you know, as a, as a first class backend. Um, hey, so that, that's the long term intention for, for that. But, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess the long and short of it is that there are, there's a, a goodly number of projects happening here. Um, and I've, I've gathered those together as well into a Telegram group where we have uh, representation from, from each of these different teams, also from the Viper team, uh, from Consensus Diligence, one of whom has, is, is the uh, de facto maintainer of the, the Solidity Grammar, rootstock trailer bits and, and so on. There's lots of stuff going on. That's, that's the, uh, the long and short thing. Great, thanks for that background, Bob. Could, could you say a little bit more about the uh, timelines involved, uh, if there's any sort of consensus on the adoption of uh, bytecode into uh, any of the flavors of Ethereum, kind of the time horizon that you see that happening? Uh, adoption of which, sorry? Of uh, WebAssembly bytecode. Well, so the thing to say about WebAssembly on the on the Ethereum side is that that, that is a an Ethereum two feature. Now, when and how Ethereum two is actually going to happen is a a matter of constant debate. You know, it seems to be perennially on a on an eighteen months away timeline. Um, the the beacon chain, which is phase one of the Ethereum 2 deployment, is slated um, for later this year. 
But beyond that initial beacon chain phase, you have a, a phases in which shards are added as phase one, and then sh phase two is the in, is the inclusion of execution environments, eWASM being one of those. So the, the timeline for eWASM within Ethereum is is probably eighteen months or so away. So okay, thanks. Um, um, but 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 just. The, the the thing which can definitely happen and will happen earlier is if you have an EVM backend to one of these new toolings, you know, you, you have an alternate Solidity compiler which can be used with Ethereum 1 or, or ETC. And, and, and to me, that's, that's one of the most exciting elements because it, it really gets us beyond having a, a, a sort of a single compiler as the monopoly on that language. You know, there isn't there isn't a, a proper governance around how the Ethereum language is defined and, and and updated and so on. So that's that's sort of a missing piece, which I think can happen ahead of anything on on the eWASM line. Bob, I, just a quick question: what is the what is the delta between eWASM and standard WASM right now? And um, what is the likelihood that eWASM support will actually get? Upstreamed into LLVM. The eWASM support be upstreamed? Yes, is now that was what you just what you said earlier, right? No, no. What I said earlier was EVM. Oh, and oh, got it. Okay, sorry. The, so, so, the so what's the difference between? Yeah, what's the delta mm -hmm. between WASM and and eWASM then? Um, it's insertion of gas counting. So you know the the, the key feature that you have within the Ethereum virtual machine is this gas mechanism where particular opcodes have costs and you, you know gas is the is the limitation on computation so where within smart contracts you you only have a a, a pseudo turing completeness because of the halting problem, you know, you don't right. want smart contracts that can go into infinite loops or, or so on, because those are a denial of service vector. So the um, denial of service attack um, vector. So what you have with the gas counting is, is, is essentially, you know, you are, you, you're on the clock for your opcodes. And if you run out of gas, then, you know, the, the thing is aborted. So then that's the difference that you have between WebAssembly and, and eWASM is when you're doing the code generation for an eWASM execution, it's going to be inserting these gas counting elements around the blocks, which, okay. which really are, are quite analogous to something like exception handling, you know, that you're adding this kind of commit rollback block handling. But this, so, this doesn't require... Well, a, a, a rewrite or anything of the, the, the back end support, right? This is this is just calling external. Let's just uh, I <clears throat> yes, let me interject here. Um, gas cost is counted by the, the, the virtual machine, not an LLVM does not insert gas counting instructions. There's no special support needed in LLVM. The gas count is done by the virtual machine. Right. If, okay. if it was done in, in LLVM instructions, it would be very easy to cheat. Yeah, um, and that was that was sort of my second question. Was um, I know we've been in the work we're doing with with Wasm right now. Um, we're providing a bunch of optimized native code re routines. We're not using Wasi, but for the interfaces. But that's largely because of the the people who are writing the the Wasm support for us. Um, are there stock packages that are going along with the um, eWASM EVM for native acceleration of operations? And are those being provided? In terms are there, of are there certain, of... like certain cryptographic routines, right? I don't really want to run those. Yes, I can compile my JSON parser and my crypto routines as, um, as wasm bytecode, um, but it's horribly slow. Um, so in most cases, we're providing native functions that can be invoked um, for accelerated ac uh, access to 
crypto routines? Is there a stock package that goes along with um, the Solidity, EWASM, EVM support here? There's, um, so in EWASM, there are a, a set of um, functions available um, to the EWASM environment, um, like get block, block hash, uh, store, contract right. store, okay. yep. but none of those, there are no crypto functions. So you, the crypto functions will have to be- Have to be implemented as the WASM bytecode. Yes, exactly. So okay. this is also been doing in so long. Um, I have some C code, get, gets compiled. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but I mean, that doesn't stop. So, so one of the nice things about um, starting to work with WASM and I mean, take from, for me, the closest example is obviously Burrow, but um, we, we have a set of, we call them natives. Um, and it, it's entirely possible to, to support the core set of uh, WASM, EWASM, um, externs and add your own. So um, like, like the EVM has actually kind of weirdly, it has two concepts. It has pre-compiles that, that, that include a few cryptographic functions. For, for example, there's um, some elliptic curve stuff that got added more recently. Um, and it also has opcodes for things like SHA, which really ought to have been pre-compiles. But you can do something entirely analogous to pre-compiles and WASM. Um, and I, I guess part of the purpose of bringing um, something like Solang um, in, into Hyperledger and, or, 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 or to work with other compilers is to try, to try and standardize um, what the sys calls effectively right. that you have the, available to you. So you definitely want to do yeah. what you're describing. The natives package, having a standard yeah. stock natives package would be an incredibly helpful thing for, for many projects that way. Thanks. Um, the one thing to do point out though is that EWASM has um, near native performance. So doing crypto in EWASM isn't as bad as it would be in EVM. Uh, and are, you, are you assuming jitter code on the back end on the interpretation or are you just uh, suggesting that the bytecode really is that efficient um well the bytecode is really is that that efficient the question is, is of course um how, how the gas costs for the opcodes relate okay um what about side channel attack resistance yeah that's, that's an interesting question yeah, I, I, it feels to me like probably, I mean, um, you, you, for, for, like for that and other reasons that it would make sense to, to have some set of natives available um, for, for some of the, you know, to get some core constant time crypto stuff. Um, okay. Um, so I think that's probably a good switching point here so we can go step into Sean's proposal itself and we can continue some of this dialogue. Uh, within the context of of that proposal, Sean, would you like to uh, um, display that yourself, or would you like us to just bring that up from the link there? Oh, maybe the, the project proposal would be um, <clears throat> yes, that would be great. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I've written down a few notes. Oh, and uh, thanks, thanks again, Bob, for uh, bringing some context to that. Yes, thank you, Bob. Um, okay, so the kind of the, the background. Much uh, I'll, I'll try to cut out all the bits that Bob covered. Um, so the Sol C um, compiler isn't particularly uh, open to contributions. Um, I've tried in the past and failed. It's a very large C++ code code base, which has a handwritten parser and a compiler backend. And the compiler backend includes, includes um, optimizing compiler parses. Um, so writing a backend compiler is a very hard thing to do. Uh, a good um, compiler backend is, is one of those great feats of engineering and PhDs and papers are still being written on that subject. Um, so Saucy targets EVM, EWASM is work in progress. Um, and because they have to write a new backend, this is taking time. And I assume once the Solidity, the Saucy EWASM backend um, work. Sean, um, it, it might be useful to people if, if you could just explain the, the, uh, how front ends and back ends work with LLVM for, for some who might not be familiar with it. Okay, right. Okay, so um, the, front end, the front of the compiler passes the, the source code, um, does the resolution of all the, the symbols, um, and then generates a, um, um, an intermediate language. 
um, the inter inter intermediate language is then read, um, read by the, the backend and the backend generates the code for that particular target. So that, that be it um, x86, WebAssembly, EVM, uh, one of those. So Solang and Sol are both front-end compilers. They do the parsing and resolution of, uh, of Solidity and then generate um, LLVM IR. So that's an intermediate language between the front end and the back end of the compiler. Um, so Solang uses LLVM for code, code gen, has a generated parser. Um, it's written in Rust, so it, it uses modern tooling. Um, full Solidity language support will be ready in full. Um, it's funded through a web free foundation grant and that grant means that there's a particular roadmap which has to be met um, in order to receive the grant hence um, language support will be ready in full else the grant won't um, uh, that's needed for the grant so um, Solang runs at the moment of the command line it reads it, it, it compiles source code to optimize WebAssembly and generates the, the uh, ABI files. Um, WebAssembly is, 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 as discussed, is a standard. There are ledger specific interfaces for, for um, contract storage, accessing core data, block hash, etc. cetera. Uh, so depending on which target Solidity uh, Solang is, is compiling for, there might be different language features uh, available, which just depend on what the underlying ledger supports. So that's the, the short term. The long term, um, what Solang would want to be is like a Solidity toolkit. We need, a, a, um, we need various things to have a great developer experience. So we need a language server so that in an IDE you get syntax highlighting, you, you can um, hover over symbols and it will tell you what they are. Um, this needs to sort of parse and resolve as you type um, a, a playground and a debugger like um, Remix uh, needs to be implemented. Um, we might need a sort of Clippy style hint system um, or, or, or linter, which will tell you that um, calculating the length of a list and then comparing to zero is inefficient and um, a uh, is empty or so might be more efficient. Um, we might want to do static analysis um, so in static analysis, you need a different IR. You need to, to know variable lifetimes, um, references to, uh, um, back references to symbols. So um, for these things, there needs to be a common um, access to, 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 to Solidity uh, representations. So earlier there was a discussion about YAL versus LLVM IR. Um, that's useful for between um, that's useful between front end compilers and back end compilers, but that's not useful for many other things we want to do. So a language server um, has no use for YAL or LLVM IR representation because um, much of the symbol information is already lost. So so long should wants to be a set of libraries and tools to access um, symbol information and IR information of um, Solidity. So then we, with those, those tools in place, those libraries in place, we can implement all those tools I just discussed. Um, lastly, uh, I wanted to say that um, whilst implementing Solang, um, using Rust as it has been actually very good. So in Rust, you, you have enums and you can use match and iterate. Um, so you can actually access specific, um, a specific representation of the IR very easily in a single, single uh, line of code. Uh, so the language is very expressive and this really helps um, for writing this type of code. Um, I think, yes, I think that's it. Any questions? So let's say we've got uh, several projects that are interested in using 
WebAssembly for, for different things. Um, for them to benefit in some way from this project, would they also need to have a, a primary interest in Solidity? I guess a different way to say this is, if you're not using Solidity, are there benefits that this project still provides? Um, it, it, it would be a, if, um, if a project would want to um, have support for a different language, so say um, Viper or, or another language, um, there are many sort of examples of, of um, um, there are many ideas about smart contract languages, um, of what those languages should look like. So this would be um, a great example of how, how to implement a smart contract compiler and uh, much of it can be reused. So you need an ABI encoder, decoder, um, you need to, to deal with contract storage and abstracting that over different uh, ledgers. Um, so this would be a, um, a great example of how, how to implement a smart contract language and, um, and parts of it could be reused to, to implement that. I could also um, give an example here that, that kind of motivates a lot of my interest in Solang and, and some of the early discussions that sort of led to, to Sean getting started on this. Um, uh, so uh, we have a very large Solidity code base um, for, that implements a business process engine and um, has a lot of hairy bits. Um, we, what we'd really like to do is we, you know, a lot of value tied up in that code, and it's not going away uh, anytime soon. But sometimes for you know the basics that the EVM and Solidity are pretty bad at, like string manipulation and other um, things that no one would ever want. Um, it would be nice if we could use another language, whether that's a smart contract domain specific language or Rust or whatever. Um, and we started thinking about, well, you know, WASM. So we put a, we have the, a WASM, which is partially experimental feature that's in Burrow now. What um, Solang would allow us to do would be to target our existing Solidity code to WASM. And then within Burrow, there's a mechanism for cross engine calls. Um, well, we wouldn't even need the cross engine calls there, but we could call in, the idea would be that we could call into other WASM code, code that was compi compiled with the same, um, with the same uh, uh, system target in there, so the same syscalls, um, so that we could start to incrementally introduce and mix um, uh, uh, rewrites of, of some of that Solidity code base and all have it coexist in a single um, WASM runtime. So that's, that's how I was thinking of using this. Thanks, I think that helps illustrate a little bit more breath there. Okay, other questions for Sean while we have him on the line here. <clears throat> so I think in previous meetings we have discussed the lack of maintainer diversity to become a project. Is that a sticking point here or are we gonna review that at some point? I think we wanna always be a little bit balanced between having a, a requirement that in order to become an active project, you have that diversity and, and uh, seeing at a stage here where, where a project is proposed that there's a path to get there versus demonstrating that you started with it already. And there's probably also a bit of a modulation of, of what we would expect to see for a proposal if, if the scope of that proposal is a tool versus a platform or something like that. Uh, so with that said, I'm getting an echo from someone, um, but with that said, uh, I am wondering what kind of features or adjustments to the proposal might help draw in other stakeholders so that we do have a good healthy start at um, a multi-vendor uh, basis for, for maintainers? Well, I think one question, which was gonna be my follow-up question would be, um, you know, I think the majority of the people on this call are from Hyperledger. How do we see adoption of this outside of Hyperledger? 
do we expect anyone outside of Hyperledger would adopt this code and use it as well? Um, it, so long certainly wants to compete with, with the utility um, component itself. So once um, SOL-C gets EWASM support, um, it has its own compiler backend and it does not use LLVM. Um, and LVM is a state-of-the-art compiler backend. It will be um, very competitive. So there is a, um, a real chance here. Yeah, and I suppose the dependency here is, is on the, uh, as, as Bob pointed out, the, uh, it's always 18 months away. You could uh, have that on a plaque. Um, so so there, is a, there is a hold up there. Like th this compiler would, you know, provided development continues well, it very likely to wipe the floor with the, um, the Solse compiler um, for Ethereum usage. usage. But that, that's not really going to come on stream until, um, until the EWASM support is there. Um, Bob mentions the, uh, the, the EVM, um, LLVM backend. Um, I mean, that is still pretty early. So, I mean, um, you referenced the, the ERC-20 ERC um, contracts, like they are not uh, the, the most complicated Solidity target. Um, it's good that they can be compiled, but for general purpose, um, uh, Solidity compilation, the author of, of, of that backend is saying that it's, it's not yet competitive with Solse. So, I don't know what the timeline on that. Um, basically, that it, e either you'd need a, a, a Ethereum, um, a, you know, greater interest in Ethereum eWASM. There are test nets you, doing eWASM stuff now, so that would drive some adoption. Um, or as a kind of transitionary period, if, if, if that backend could get good enough um, and, and be integrated with um, Solang, then, then you could see some adoption there from outside of Hyperledger. Some of the uh, future features that you've got listed there are, are maybe in the IDE space or, or related to what you would see in an IDE kind of tool. Uh, have, you, have you thought about overlap with, with other tools like Ganache? I feel like maybe that was on the mail list somewhere. Oh, I missed that. I don't remember if it was or I just imagined that. But um, anyway, just general reaction to the idea that maybe there's another development partner out there uh, in that space. Um, well, I, I, there, there's, uh, for, for some of these tools, there's, there's um, quite a bit, bit of code to be, be written. For others, there's less work. Um, so any cooperation, any sort of integration with uh, existing tooling can only help. Um, I haven't given Kanash much thought, to be fair. Okay, it's, it's something to uh, mull in the coming days here. Yes. I mean, beyond, uh, let me just switch my device. Bob, we lost you if you were planning to pick that up where you left it off. Hello, sorry, I'm back. Okay. Hello? We've got you, go ahead. Okay, sorry, yeah. Um, beyond Solang, uh, within this larger group that I'm, that I'm gathering with more general interest, um, we've got tools vendors, we've got people uh, looking at uh, formal verification of, of, of grammars. Um, we've got multiple different um, languages. Um, we've got um, teams really who are, so for example, the rootstock. So, you know, Rootstock have, have, have got their uh, Ethereum virtual machine on top of, uh, on top of the Bitcoin chain. Um, and they've been making, obviously, heavy use of, of, uh, of the EVM as well. So, I mean, I think from my perspective, 
most of the interest I'm seeing is really about the EVM itself in that you've had this situation for Ethereum where the EVM has been kind of like under maintained and very unloved really since about 2017 based on this eternal premise of the coming soon, you know, Ethereum to EWASM pairing. Um, what I think I'm seeing the interest from a lot of this group are seeing that, that having the option of alternate solidity compilers really kind of busts open that monopoly and it opens up the door for doing very basic incremental improvements in the EVM, which have been held up for two or three years, you know, such as adding support for, for opcodes for subroutines, um, looking at static jumps, um, there's another adding SIMD instructions. Um, so, can uh, I chime in a bit on that? You, you so, can. So um, in all core devs, which is the call that governs a lot of the mainnet stuff, um, one of the things that's probably going to be coming in Berlin is subroutines. Um, there's still work going on in improving the EVM. Some of my EIPs that I've submitted are works to improve that. The, the big problem, however, that mainnet's dealing with that almost dominates all performance discussion is dealing with the size of the state tree that they have for the mainnet contracts. And that is, you know, just such an overwhelming thing that, you know, looking at optimizations doesn't matter if you're going to still spend 80% of your time reading your state from disk. So that's part of the reason why EVM improvements have really escaped the, the uh, interest of the core developers is because it's, you know, by two orders of magnitude, state tree has been more of the problem. There's nothing that the that the virtual machine can do about the state tree problem. Nope. Um, the uh, so one of the reasons that uh, Solang targets uh, Wasm rather than EVM is because Wasm has much bigger a much bigger community, better tooling. Um, it, it, you can compile standard C to to Wasm and then link it. So if you want to implement your own crypto in in Wasm, that's perfectly possible. In EVM, that would re result in code which is highly inefficient because it's hard to access um, a memory by bytes, for example. Um, so moving from uh, WASM offers a, offers a whole suite of new options which are not available with EVM. Uh, it would leapfrog a whole set of problems. Uh, so for Hyperledger projects, they would use WASM and not EVM. I think, so another perspective in terms of like, I don't know whether like how to put this more strategically say for, for Hyperledger projects and why I think, um, or, or the ways in which I think that Hyperledger projects ought to be thinking about making use of Solidity. So uh, projects that have integrated Burrow, so far kind of seen it as, oh, well Solidity is this other option, which um, if you're not interested in some sense in public Ethereum, Solidity is probably a slightly curious option. I mean, it has some advantages around it. It's got the built-in um, address worldview, if, if you want that, and that makes a certain amount of sense. But where I think this gets interesting is if other Hyperledger projects want to move in a direction where they have some kind of connectivity in the sort of layer two scaling sense um, with Ethereum, come and run your, um, your side chain, your uh, you know, semi-public side chain, your scaling chain on uh, Fabrics or to Theroho or whatever, um, it, it's actually, we shouldn't just be thinking about Solidity as a language option, but providing state compatibility, function level compatibility, so that you can ship code, uh, you know, maintain a kind of single logical code base that maybe you have some uh, uh, some, some bank contract on mainline Ethereum, but you're running uh, uh, some dispute resolution stuff that is on a side chain that you can then escalate. Like it's, it's actually being able to run that same Solidity code. Um, and you could be running that in a WASM environment on, on other chains. But I think there's a, kind of missing missing a trick really if if, you're, if it if doesn't move us in, towards some kind of uh, public ethereum connectivity not just a language option which is not that interesting in itself i have to agree i think a set of common host functions that we could plug in this execution environment into any of the other dlts would move the smart contract space immensely forward that's what i think is most interesting about hyperledger moving into the wasm space is it gives us a great opportunity to standardize what that would look like across DLTs. 
Yes, I agree. I've, so I've been implementing um, um, I've, been, I've been implementing targets in Solang, and there's there's huge um, the the different uh, host functions look very different on the on the different um, ledgers, and by combining those or seeing the, all of those in one project, it's possible to see that um, a common set is, is possible and will will benefit everyone. I mean, I mean Sean, if, if if you if if Solang gets a few more maintainers and, and gets some success, do you would you see it as like mission creep to support other languages using the same smart contract model? No, not at all. Um, um, I, I I hope, and the way I've written it is that that um, a large part can be reused. the The first parser stage would obviously have to be um, replaced. Um, but much hopefully can be reused and make make language a uh, new language support uh, easier. Um, to my mind, that's a that's a key feature really of 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 looking at LLVM as a base is that the whole framework is 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 really built for suites of compiler uh, tools. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a, a complete, you know, switchable back and front ends perfect pattern, but um, you really have got a situation where having alternate languages while sharing, you know, many parts of, uh, of the pipelines is, is, uh, is, is a, you know, a key factor you get out of this. I, I see solidity really as sort of being like the C, a sort of stage. You know that we're, we're that we're at here is a an initial kind of like de facto standard language, but it's not necessarily the safest or the best, um, or what you're really going to want many people to be using longer term. I think DSLs are really going to be like ruling the roost down the line having a mature framework that you've got these things on um, is certainly going to be the best basis for, for moving towards that world over time. Okay, uh, and I think we'll, we'll leave it there. So we've got uh, next week off uh, for, the, for further discussion on this point, but, but a lot of us will be face-to-face -face in Arizona. So hopefully some more discussions can take place there. Uh, and then uh, it'll be the following week that we return for a TSC meeting where we could resume this discussion and uh, we'll see if as we approach that date, whether we put this back on for a, a vote at that stage or, or further discussion. We've um, got real quickly, Sean and Bob, will either of you be um, at the global forum? Hi, this is Sean. Yes, I, I will be there. I am in, um, I'm in Las Vegas now, um, so yes. So I, I sadly will not be there, um, but somebody who will be there is is Michael uh, from uh, Second State, who uh, are the developers of the Sol uh, uh, tool as well. So I'm really hoping that he and Sean can meet, and that uh, also that uh, that Second State can talk <laughs> about potential contribution of their code base into Hyperledger as well. You know, I'm really thinking that uh, that labs can be a place where we can do collaboration across all of these tools cool yeah no i, I was wondering we could do like a birds of a feather thing potentially so uh, yeah, we, yeah i was just going to flag that there is there is one on the books um i think sean put it on or, or some, somebody did um but yeah have a look on the birds of feather there's a there's a wasm table so uh uh yeah hopefully hopefully we can all meet up there um i created one um on um Smart contract languages and wasm. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we've got uh, two last topics on the agenda for today. One is the transact update. Uh, I see there's one written piece of feedback there that can be addressed offline. Uh, if there's any quick questions, we could hit that, or I know Mark's been hanging out here on the call. If there was anything that you wanted to point out urgently, Mark, uh, and if not, we can. Uh, switch to the other topic. Yeah, not in particular, Dan. I mean, I think uh, the report speaks for itself, and I did see um, Mark's comment about uh, about the uh, looking for more detailed numbers. 
Yeah, and it's just a general comment for actually all projects. You know, when you say no change from last month or whatever, then people have to actually go off and look and, and see where if you just, you know, cut and paste from last month or whatever, last quarter, then we have it. It's a lot of projects to review. Yep, I understand. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and jump into the long term agenda topic. Uh, as anticipated, we really only have a few minutes to go through this, but wanted to at least start some discussion so that we've got a more um, more directed series of agendas for the remainder of, of the session of the TSC. Um, we asked the architecture group with, with kind of little notice to, to help prime us for this. Uh, but Mick was able to generate some notes from their meeting yesterday. I don't know if people have had an opportunity to read that, uh, but that is linked within this new topic. And that is a, a good read to, to have some difficult questions there that we should be pursuing. Um, so I think given the, the limited amount of time that we have today, uh, one thing that we can still accomplish here is just to kind of run through the TSC members and get some initial reaction to this <clears throat> direction of, of thought generally. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as the, <clears throat> I'm gonna have to break for a drink here in just a sec. Sorry I'll that. break the fourth wall while you're taking a drink of water. And I, I just wanna say to the TSC, I really appreciate that you're taking a look at all this stuff today. This is awesome. Thanks for that interlude for me. <clears throat> I think I still might lose my voice here. Hopefully I get it back for uh, next week. Um, so yeah, so I guess to, to get through it, it, for TSC members, if you've had some thought to think about what kind of questions that we could do uh, with the initial goal being, let's, let's frame out the the big pieces, the direction that we want to explore and not so much worry about, can we define that direction today? Uh, what other sorts of questions would we want to add to this list? I think one of the things based on mixed mail, my interpretation of it is we need a stronger like architecture working group. We seem to spin up these cross-platform projects without really taking into account when we do, you know, it's like, here's our interface, you can use it or walk away. It's not, let's figure out how we can start this thing and have a common interface for everyone to use that fits into, you know, multiple platforms. My view, anyways, I don't know if others feel the same way, but that limits adoption, so. Yeah, and I think that, that also, pulls out one of the one of the ideas that I wanted to get some reaction to is can we bring the scope that we had originally given in, in the architecture working group can we bring some of that back into these TSC discussions and is there interest in us doing that I would <clears throat> at least point out that I'm not sure that there was much of an original scope um, on that it's always been sort of a descriptive group for the most part on it but just to second Mark's comment is that the given the inertia in the existing projects, um, that it's always cheaper and easier to take what you have, even if it's just good enough. Um, that without without some sense of strong encouragement um, from the TSC or some other organization. Um, adoption of, of sort of comma modules broadly across the projects is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, that And that's just the pragmatics of we all do what we do and we know what we know. And it's hard to look at something that we don't know that somebody else is controlling and be dependent upon it. I think that's an important point. Thanks for thanks for highlighting that further, Mick. Um, the the how these projects are funded and how they're they're driven 
uh, has implications that are hard for us to uh, work in a way that's orthogonal to that. Okay, so uh, we are unfortunately down to the last minute here. So thanks for getting us started on, on this and we can bring this up uh, at our next TSC session. And again, uh, a lot of discussion opportunities next week. Look forward to seeing all of you that will be there. And uh, if you won't be there, I'm sure there'll be a lot of things being echoed back on um, mail lists and chat forums and look for uh, any other sorts of interesting updates that we might percolate back out to the TSC in the following week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dan.